Well, good morning. Thank you everyone for coming in to the State House to uh, help us uh, stay in tune with what's going on in the world of uh, housing and conservation, land work. Uh, happy to be here, uh, a joint meeting with uh, House, the Senate Economic Development, Housing and Military Affairs, as well as Senate Natural Resources and Energy. So uh, Senator Rockin told me that he's already spoken with you briefly. Uh, particularly appreciative of you all coming. My own entry into the legislature was through working in the Middlebury Area Land Trust um, decades ago. So that was the door in this work for me, and uh, we, we all appreciate the work you do. We're uh, delighted to be able to get an update from you in person on the work you're doing. So we're here to listen. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Senator Sorokin? Oh, yes, please. So let's just quickly go around the table, starting with Senator Perrin, and we'll introduce ourselves. Senator Corey Perrin, Franklin County, Albert. Uh, Brian Campion, Bennington County, and Wilmington. Um, Michael Sorokin from Chittenden County, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to leave for a little while, but I will be back, and I was glad to <laughs> talk to you before. That was great. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. Cheryl Hooker, Rutland. Becca Ballant, Wyndham. And Nancy Owens. Okay. Hi. Take it away. All right, thank you. Um, so my name is Nancy Owens. I'm president of Housing Vermont. And, um, and so thank you for giving us an opportunity to be here today to talk about our work on housing and conservation and how it supports the goals um, of this institution and the state related to climate change, energy, the economy, and, and housing. And, um, so the Vermont Housing Conservation Coalition is a group of about 50 plus different participants, nonprofits, and businesses, private businesses who are here today in the State House, and there's a whole lot more than 50 of us, but um, <laughs> coming to, uh, to advocate for increased state investment through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board to finance affordable housing and conservation. Um, you know, across the country, people are clamoring for affordable housing, and, and its lack um, is contributing to, to health issues, social issues, and economic problems. And v Vermont is really no different. I think the one difference is, there's no different in the sense of the need, but the additional thing that Vermonters are seeking, besides affordable housing, are jobs that are going to provide us sufficient income to live decently, and, and really the sense of place that we have, and our access to natural resources, and our care, and our concern for a healthy environment. So for more than 30 years, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board has been the vehicle to achieve these critical state and community goals, to create and protect affordable housing, water quality, farmland protection, rural economic development, our recreational assets. But with, we've heard a little bit about this already this morning, you know, the rapid rise in the real estate market, the changing environment, um, combined with this relatively flat wage growth, people are really losing economic ground. So now, we're, now is the time to fully fund VHCB. That would result in $22.4 million to make investments that counter these losses and catalyze new growth and create new opportunities. We know we can do that. We have evidence of our success at making a real change in these areas that we're focused on and you care about. I'm going to talk about those changes related to housing, and there are the people following me who are going to focus on other issues. So let me turn now to my area of expertise around affordable housing and economic development. Um, so broadly speaking, um, Housing Vermont works statewide to address housing and economic development needs of low and moderate income people. We've been in business over 30 years and produced over 6,000 affordable apartments in more than 180 developments in towns all around the state. Um, to do that, we've raised and invested uh, private capital, private equity from banks, over $360 million, which is leveraging another $470 million in that time from private and public investments. In addition, we run a program through Vermont Rural Ventures, which creates favorable financing for investments in economic development, new businesses, including uh, down in Bennington right now, where um, we've invested in the Putnam Block. Um, there's over $128 million that we've brought in from external investors into Vermont to support those economic development projects. 
whose purpose really is to produce jobs in low-income areas and, and to bring in new services in those same communities. So certainly, I think everyone can see uh, is, is there's so much work and study linking housing and the economy. And many members of the Senate um, Committee uh, on Economic and Housing um, have just been a really serious time investment over the last six months traveling the state, holding hearings, and talking with people, talking with um, individuals, um, with businesses, with <laughs> providers about the housing shortage, um, housing cost, housing quality, and how those issues are impacting our economy and businesses and people. So we truly, really appreciate your work to, to go out and meet with people and learn more about this. Um, and certainly the work of the legislature as a whole in supporting the housing revenue bond back in 2017, that $37 million bond has been um, created enormous impact and um, resulted in hundreds of new homes. Um, what I want to um, turn to now and what you may not know is as clearly as the economic link is also how the housing work really has a positive impact on our environment. So residential and commercial buildings in the U.S. account for more than 40 percent of energy consumption in total and when you look at even from a global impact buildings as an operation um, account for almost uh, almost 30 percent of carbon emissions. So in, in our work, we're very focused on this energy topic, both from a climate change and carbon footprint perspective, but also from an economic perspective, and that as we make those investments and our buildings operate more <coughs> efficiently, our costs are lower, which enable us to keep our rents affordable. So it's very good business practice as well as an environmental practice. Um, and the work that we've done uh, it really compares very favorably to any conventional residential builder. And I want to um, acknowledge that our practices and our learning and, um, and we also, uh, also are attributed with Efficiency Vermont as a great partner and the Clean Energy Development Fund, both on a financial and technical assistance level. Um, so for example, to just get a little more specific, we've installed over 1,000 solar panels that are now generating an estimated 370,000 kilowatts in solar power every year, avoiding half a million ton of carbon dioxide, which is the equivalent of driving 639,000 miles. Um, another uh, specific example, again, relating environment and housing, in 2019, with our housing revenue bonds, we had just finished uh, a near net zero building that's in White River Junction. It's an apartment building with 30, um, 30 apartments, has a, a, a garage um, on the ground floor, an elevator, center corridor, community space. It's a, it's a big, substantial building. And we made a really um, purposeful and intensive uh, investment in the thermal shell and utilized some innovative approaches around heating and cooling. Um, and last year, with the building fully occupied in the month of August, uh, without air conditioning, the indoor, um, so it's warm outside, but um, without using air conditioning, but just this central ventilation system, the indoor temperature was a very comfortable 72 degrees, and our electric bill, after netting it from our solar, net, net metering our solar PV system, the electric bill for the entire building and all of the apartments was $289 because wow. of our, the way that that building was built. And that, but that took a, a capital investment to get that kind of outcome. And we know those results because not only are we making the capital investment in the, in the equipment, we're also making an investment in um, measuring, and op measuring the results um, tracking those results and optimizing those results through a data acquisition system so we understand what's happening in the building. Because we want, the, it is a capital intensive investment to make those kinds of improvements. We want to make sure we get that, the results from that work. Um, and the other environmental point I want to make about housing is just that we've had this very um, important and foundational policy in the state of Vermont to focus on our villages, centers, our downtowns as um, a way to um, curb sprawl. 
But there's more than that. What happens in our downtowns, we know, is um, the Vermont Center for Geographic Information tells us that the households who live in our downtowns drive 50% less than the average Vermonter. And we can see that in our properties. For example, we just completed here in Montpelier at Taylor Street over the new um, Montpelier um, Transit Center. Those folks are well positioned to not, not have to use their car as frequently as others. So those examples I just rounded off are all new construction, and those, those are great, and um, we do reduce carbon footprint and sort of do much better than many other builders. But without a doubt, and the point I want to emphasize is that where we really um, get the biggest bang for the buck on our housing investments related to climate change is when we renovate our, our old and leaky buildings. And I, I know you, you, I hope that you've heard this from others, but it's certainly the case um, down in Bristol and Addison County, Pleasant Hills is a senior housing property where we made improvements to the thermal shell and heating system and as a result cut our fuel bills in half. Um, and again, back here in Montpelier, the French block people are familiar with Efficiency Vermont. Uh, that's a historic, if you're not familiar with it, it's a historic building right in the downtown. Um, option hardware is on the ground floor. The French block, uh, Efficiency Vermont calculated that our efforts reduce the carbon footprint by 186,000 pounds of carbon per year. And I would, the other really interesting and um, important thing we didn't expect or didn't realize would happen was our neighbor, Abishan, called us after the first winter. They hadn't really done any work on their ground floor, but we had fully renovated the upstairs, insulated the upper floors, which had been vacant for 80 years. They called us to tell us that they're spending 50% less on their heating bills. Right. So because of the, the work that we had done on the building, and that benefited this, a, a business um, in the building. So spending energy dollars on renovation is really, that's where we get our biggest return on that investment. Um, and we know that, um, that that's just, that's just an effective use of our dollars. Um, and I, I, I would, um, one of my concerns, generally I want to just put out there and this opportunity to say is that, um, you know, we have a great energy code and we're getting great new buildings under it, but, um, that we're getting good buildings, but right now in Vermont, the energy code is updated every three years. And it feels a little bit like um, the perfect is the enemy of the good in terms of pushing that energy code further and further on new buildings. While um, maybe it's a better investment or could be, it could be a more impact by thinking about how do we how do we focus our efforts on the buildings that we have? Mm -hmm. so buildings are, the buildings that we have are here to stay. They're not going anywhere. We're not actually building a tremendous number of new buildings in the state. And the code that we have is really pretty remarkable. We're getting great results with it. So I just would um, think about how do we focus on our existing housing stock and make improvements. I also want to focus on that because, in fact, you know, climate change and the impacts around climate change um, around the world and here in Vermont as well impact low-income people more substantially. People are living in less valuable properties in less valuable, but more, more vulnerable locations. You think about that existing housing stock that's in poor quality, who's living in those buildings as opposed to that new building that gets built? So we need to make investments in, um, in areas around climate change and housing that benefit um, those who might not be able to do that on their own. And increasing PHCB funding to the full funding is what we need to be able to do that. And so I really, um, we'll be able to improve the buildings where low-income people live. We'll be able to affect more um, positive impact on the climate. So thank you very much. I want to make sure I have time for others. We have a, um, a yeah. question or two. We have a very full schedule. So we have a center camping center and center bound. Yeah. So thank you, Nancy. And also thanks for your investment down at, in the podcast. Really yeah. appreciate it. Uh, can you just say a little bit more about how you identify buildings that you're going to go into and, and renovate? Are, is this 
you know, when I think of downtown Bennington, downtown Brattleboro, you know, there are a lot of areas that a lot of homes that are either um, partially occupied, not occupied. Tell us a little bit more about how you identify and make those investments and decide to make those investments. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because these are built, I, and just maybe for clarification, my help, yeah. are these buildings that you already own that you're going in and then renovating, or you're choosing new buildings to, to work on? Both of those oh, things okay. are true. So we have, among the nonprofit organizations I mentioned, we have at least 6,000 apartments. Mm -hmm. Among us all, I think there's something like 10,000 homes that have been supported with VHCB. And as you know, that's a perpetual investment. Right, forever affordable. And so there is an element of sustaining those homes over time and reinvesting and, and imp making improvements. So that is a piece of it. And the other piece is, is acquiring new properties, new, new uh, mm -hmm. existing properties, or building new buildings. And it's really driven, um, it's driven by policy consideration you know, which is set among our housing funders and by the legislature itself. Where, where should we be purchasing homes? What, are, what goals are we trying to accomplish? As well as by the needs of that particular community. Some communities, as the committee learned when you went to visit, some communities simply need more supply. Mm -hmm. and, and housing, there just isn't enough housing. In other communities uh, down in Rutland, right. I think the issue is really housing quality. So how do we repair and improve those houses? So that's part of our equation, is, is the need and the policy that drives us. Mm -hmm. And then it's just real estate, right? It's right. an evaluation. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for making the trip up from Bennington to be here. Thank you very much. I had a driver, John Campbell from the Vermont Land Trust. Good driver. <laughs> yeah. No, he just record. And he drove up with his wife in the back seat the entire way. <laughs> That's right. right. Generally, it went pretty well. Yeah. I don't think I want to ask anything more about that. Right. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for it. Invited me to uh, spend a few minutes with you today, and I'm Dave Newell. I'm from uh, the Bennington area, uh, home area of Senator Campion, yes, right here. Thank you. Uh, and I am the president of the Prospect Mountain Association. Um, we had some tremendous support from the Vaughan Housing and Conservation Board. In our case, it was conservation and economic development were the themes. And what's being passed out to you now is a page, I think, from the Vermont Land Trust Annual Report that describes very briefly the project that a community group engaged in back at the end of 2018. Prospect Mountain Ski Area has been around in the Bennington area for many years. It opened in the late 30s, and it was a hometown downhill alpine ski area with a rope tow. Had a number of private owners from then till the end of 2018. A uh, very important rec outdoor recreation and now economic driver for our area. Um, the history here is um, in 1982 there were cross country ski trails put in there for the first time. Ten years later, a local gentleman, Steve Whittem, and his partner, Andrea Amadeo, uh, purchased the ski area out of foreclosure from the Merchants Bank. And they successfully ran this ski area uh, for 25 years. They made the decision at that time in 92 to end the alpine skiing there and focus solely on cross country and Nordic skiing and snowshoeing. Um, the Steve and his partner made it clear after 25 years of working pretty hard at this that they would prefer to move on with the next phase of their lives and uh, leaked this information to a bunch of us locally who were always skiing and active and, and up there. And we decided to take it upon ourselves to work with them and find out if we could find a way to transfer the ownership of this Nordic ski area to a nonprofit 501c3 community organization. Uh, I was one of those folks, and uh, we began talking to them, and the price tag, which was fair, was 900000 for this ski area, which included 144 acres of land, five buildings, uh, all the equipment, uh, grooming equipment, snowmobiles, piston bully, the whole thing, and we had a lease with the Forest Service, which expands our trail network to about 30K of trails up there. But I knew that this project was going to be a bit of a daunting one, so I called my friend Don Campbell, the guy who drove me up here, and I said, Don, uh, we have in front of us this prospect of buying prospect. Can you help? And he said, yes. What I can do is um, help you 
develop a grant to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board to help support this great project, as well as give you folks some help with the campaign, which we had to do to raise some money locally. He did a tremendous job at that, and uh, we had the excellent support from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, who awarded us a grant of 265000 to against our $900,000 commitment for this, which jump-started our effort tremendously. When that was made public and folks knew about this, it really changed everybody's attitude about, well, this really is possible, and now we can do it. And we, with the help of the land trust and a tremendous amount of local committee support and folks, began a fundraising campaign locally. And we partnered with Williams College, which is a fine school right south of us in Williamstown, Mass., to help us with this. And they ended up paying half the purchase price, which is $450,000. The reason they did that is their Nordic team practices there, they train there, and the Williams Carnival is there every other year. It's 20 minutes away from their campus. But the overall support on this, uh, the reason we did it was uh, for the community to have this great Nordic ski area preserved and to preserve the mountainside in exchange for the VHCB grant. We now have an easement on the mountain itself for 120 plus acres, now open for public recreation in perpetuity, can never be developed. And it's a very important wildlife habitat also and watershed for that area. We got little baby bears singing up there right now with their moms. Yeah. Uh, and no bears, the bears will be out in late March. They do spring skiing a lot. <laughs> we like to see it. Uh, the net result is we're able to make the deal. We raised about 200, 325,000 locally, again, spurred on by the VACB grant. We had the Williams 450. And we're able to make this transaction, and now the ski area and is owned, mountain preserved by the, our Prospect Mountain Association of 501c3. Uh, why did we do this? Well, we know about conservation and uh, local recreation, but we are a, a quietly a pretty solid economic driver for Southern Vermont. We have over 400 season pass holders who come to ski at Prospect Mountain from six different states. And that doesn't include Vermont, those six states. Seven, when you throw Vermont in there. We have about over 3,500 skier visits a year, and these folks are coming to our area to ski, enjoy, have some dinner, stay overnight. Some of them have second homes. It's a, it's a very solid uh, wintertime and, and, and increasingly 12-month uh, economic importance to our area. We have a variety of events up there which are great. Uh, National Snowshoe Championships have been there twice, 2014 and 2018, brings 300 elite snowshoe racers to our area. We have the Williams Carnival, that's happening next month, brings 100 plus uh, Division I NCAA skiers and all their support folks there. Vermont High School Champs have been there several times. Massachusetts schools use our area as well as New York State because they don't have as much snow as we have. We have about a 2,300 foot elevation and we're easily accessible. One of Prospect's major uh, attributes is you can get to our place easier from down south than anywhere else uh, in the Green Mountain State except Brattleboro. <laughs> So that's a huge benefit for us. Bill Coke Youth Ski League, of course, all the young kids age two on up use it. And this translates into, of course, <coughs> excuse me, rooms and meals and second homes, as I mentioned. But this would not have been possible without that grant that we got from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board and the tremendous support and advice we got from the Land Trust, uh, which really is, a, is an organization that does some, some excellent work in Vermont. And we were the beneficiary of that. <coughs> So I certainly think the VHCB is worthy of the legislature's support. And now we have a, a 501c3 managing this ski area, which has gone pretty well. There's no tax dollars involved in that. We're responsible for ourselves in season pass and managing and paying our employees and making it work. And it is working. Uh, so that's our story. Happy to take questions and love to have you come down sometime. Enjoy our trails. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, we have four more speakers and only another half hour, so I'm a little conscious of time, uh, unless there's sort of a pressing question. Just a uh, really quick Hooker. one. How many people work for your 501? The guy who we bought it from stayed on as our mountain manager, and he's a full-time employee. But other than him, we have part-time seasonal employees, and that would be, now we have two plus him, 
And we also have some nice high school kids who come to help us in the wintertime. So we probably have a staff of six or seven there in the, in the winter and a staff of one all year long, which would be our mountain manager. Mm -hmm. right. well, thank you and congratulations on that work. It's also great as a reminder for all of us of the diversity of the portfolio of projects that um, your organizations uh, are supporting. Chris, may I just make a request? Would, would you be kind of just to send us the tax impact of, uh, you alluded to it, but you don't have it here, the tax impact on Prospect Mountain to the, that area? I probably could bump something on that, yes. That's right. It's just, right. it's just part of our advocacy. Yeah. <laughs> And you are Steve Libby. Yeah, I'm Steve Libby. I'm the uh, executive director of the Vermont River Conservancy, and we're here as a team. Um, Mark is the oh. chairperson of the uh, Hancock Select Board, and Kevin Geiger is a senior planner of the Two Rivers uh, Ottaquichi Regional Planning Commission. Um, we're here to talk about a project that we work together on in the town of Hancock. It's a small land conservation project, but part of what I think is a emerging sort of understanding about how important rivers are and conservation along rivers are to both um, long-term flood resilience, but also to economic uh, economic aspects. Um, and I just our organization um, for the last 25 years from our river conservancy has worked closely with VHCB to provide public access to public waters. Um, we focus particularly on swimming holes, and I know it's hard on January 30th to think about swimming holes, but six months from now, this will be a major part of the Vermont culture is people going to swimming holes and enjoying them. And we found that um, you know, swimming holes are available to everybody, no matter their economic means, and so protecting public access to Vermont rivers is uh, important and very um, strongly supported by VHCB over the years. So I want to make a point of that. But this particular project that we're talking about today is in the town of Hancock. I have um, a site plan. I don't know if you folks can see this. I should have maybe I blown it up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is a five and a half acre parcel of land right adjacent to the White River in the town of Hancock. So if folks were to drive down Route 100 through Waitsfield and Warren and over the gap through Granville, you come into the mighty town of Hancock. Um, Tropical Storm Irene, you know, August of 2011, really ripped apart the town. Um, the Upper Hawaii River was really decimated by the flooding of Tropical Storm Irene, and that really changed a lot of the thinking about river management in the state. So this project is really a result of that changing the thinking about how we manage land along our rivers. Um, the property at that time was a junkyard. It was owned by a local auto repair. It was a licensed uh, salvage yard. It was in the floodplain. It was you know, very vulnerable to flooding. Um, with the help of Kevin and Two Rivers, uh, we worked together with the town of Hancock to purchase the property and convert that junkyard into a restored floodplain area that now has public access to the White River. Um, in that particular project, what I think is it was small in acreage, but it's in, indicative of how we need to kind of rethink about how we work along rivers. And the VHCB support for this project was really critical in two ways. One, it was uh, critical matching money to funds that Two Rivers out of Quichi were able to, uh, federal funds. So this being able to match federal funds was very important. But also VHCB, uh, along with the River Conservancy, will be the long-term co-holders of the conservation easement on the property. And I think that's something that we want to make sure people understand is that it's great and important to provide the funding up front to preserve the properties, but the long-term success of that conservation is really going to rest on being able to make sure those easements are properly stewarded. So VHCB has been very important to us on both of that sections. So I think I'll turn over to Monica to give you the perspective of the person in the community who was right in the middle of this. Sure. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about Hancock. It's not an opportunity that comes up very often. We are a very small town of about 323-ish people, and um, we are about 80% owned by the Green Mountain National Forest. So our tax base is quite small, and our median income, I don't have the exact number, but it's fairly low. Our housing stock is old. 
Um, we have uh, an aging population, and so um, it's very important for us to have a way to bring in some economic development to town. Uh, in addition to being a flood hazard, this property, um, developing it as a site for public access really helps us bring people into town who then hopefully um, are able to patronize the few businesses that are there in our, in our quote, downtown. <laughs> um, but uh, it's very, it's actually right next to a convenience store. Um, and it connects to the White River Partnerships um, what, uh, River Trail. So that's also a very important part in that it ties our economic development also to the region uh, because we are an isolated valley and we all really need to work together, the towns of Granville, Hancock, and Rochester to keep ourselves going. So the funding to make this project possible was critical. We could not have done this on our own. We looked at it as definitely a flood hazard. The neighbors uh, who border this property were always in fear that they would end up with toxic residue in their backyards, old cars in their backyards, which was very much a reality, and that we would have to be pulling all this stuff out of the river eventually. So. Um, Without the help of this funding, there is no way a town like Hancock could have pulled this off. And we really appreciate having had the, um, the partnership of the River Conservancy, BHCB, um, Two Rivers, the White River Partnership, all the many, many partners that worked on this. So if I can have just a minute of the committee's time. Um, so I'm Kevin Geiger. I was co-lead, I am co-lead still, of the state's buyout program for Irene. And if you think that's old news, the uh, we're having a buyout today in Pittsfield. Uh, so it's still ongoing. Part of that was very critically funded by $2 million in BHCB money. Um, that money directly went to 26 properties. Uh, that are part of the 155 that have been bought out across the state. Um, but what it did is also every property that was bought out has the ability to have a VHCB easement on it. And so we are able to do that with properties that the VHCB money does not touch. Um, that money was critical. It was one-time funding back in Irene. It is not a one-time risk, though. And unfortunately, we have a dozen more properties that came on our list from last Halloween storm, and there is no money to be helping those people out. Um, and so we, we urge you to continue funding BHCB as much as you can uh, for their help in many, many areas, including reducing flood risk. And, you know, the, the serious consequences of people being in flood zones and flood zones. And um, Steve's patience on this project was uh, outstanding because there was a lot of touch and go times. <laughs> Um, Steve, can you say just something briefly around the water quality issues in terms of how you partner with uh, VHCB, Land Trust, and others? One of the things people have, as our understanding of water quality issues has grown, I think our stewardship, my understanding is our interpretation of what stewardship obligations has also grown with it. Can you say something about stewardship and water quality on um, certain properties and projects? Sure. So I think that the, the primary connection between conserving land along rivers and water quality is that um, there's, a, there's a couple different things. One is the floodplain function that preserved lands along rivers provide. And we've encroached, we society, economic, have encroached on rivers for 200 years. You know, rivers were the economic drivers of uh, the Vermont economy over the water power area. So we've done a lot of, a long history of, of moving in close to rivers. And rivers need that area to naturally establish um, meander patterns and all. And when rivers have the ability to achieve that natural kind of stability of those patterns, then there's less net erosion of sediment along rivers. And that 
um, less net erosion means less nutrients are going into the rivers and being, in the case of Lake Champlain Basin, deposited in the lake, in the case of the Connecticut River, ending up in Long Island Sound. So there's a sort of direct connection between water quality in the long term and stability of river corridors, and conserved land along rivers helps create that stability. So. Great. Thank you very much. Any other quick questions from the panel? All right. Just thank so, you. So, our race ride on. And actually, Hancock has big impact because so many of us drive through it trying to get to Middlebury. Absolutely. <laughs> Over the gap. Absolutely. My name is Josh Ryan. I'm the uh, founder and principal of Timber and Stone LLC. We're a uh, trail building contractor outfit based in East Montpelier. I like to say loud and proud that I am way more comfortable wearing a pair of work pants and a tool belt and standing in mud rather than wearing a suit. So that said, uh, my wife is impressed I got this thing on. So. <laughs> that said, I'm going to, uh, if I may approach and uh, provide these, I'm going to encourage you to go on a hike with me here. Um, these are pictures of projects that were built on VHCB funded properties located throughout the state of Vermont. They're all different, so I encourage you to pass them around and uh, check them out. Fifteen years ago, I saw an open niche for professional trail contracting within Vermont. This was after about almost 20 years of working with Vermont Youth Conservation Corps and seeing an opportunity to take our towns into the woods of Vermont. Um, once the land has been conserved using VACB funding, our phone rings, and we are then invited out to properties that, such as the ones you're seeing right there. Our niche is providing accessible trails to all people, no matter of their mobility and uh, interest in being in the outdoors. <coughs> so a lot of pictures you're seeing are boardwalks, stone stairs, naturally surfaced pathways, places that families, friends, visitors to Vermont can come to. One thing that I've been tracking as I've been uh, participating in the Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative, which is Governor Scott's uh, initiative, I'm on their steering committee, and over the last three years I've been uh, a quiet voice, but uh, a mighty one, um, sharing our impact on the economy in Vermont. And so although we only gross 850 to a million per year, and we have seven to 12 uh, employees, we do work on 25 to 40 projects. A percentage of those are VACB funded, and we're seeing that increase, I think because of the interest of getting people of all abilities and physical abilities out into the, the wilds. So some of the numbers I came together, uh, when we pull into a community, whether it be in southern Vermont or in the Northeast Kingdom, to build a project, we are sinking our dollars into those lumber yards and those steel shops and those welders. So we are a mobile force of hundreds of thousands of dollars going into in individual communities. When we leave, we leave a piece of infrastructure that you're seeing that visitors and tourists and local residents are using, school groups are using for education to um, interact with the wetlands uh, or the mountaintops. So that is uh, a main driving force as to why I was invited to come and speak with you is uh, I also should say I'll speak on behalf of there's four or five like uh, you know organizations like mine in Vermont. Uh, I am fortunate enough to also work in seven other states every year. We travel quite a bit. Um, I'm very understanding family, um, and uh, each trail is unique. But I am also very proud to share that oftentimes when we're working in Southern Connecticut. I then find they're emailing me and saying, where else have you done work? Well, go check out Raven Ridge in Moncton. Nature Conservancy did an amazing job there. There's a 900 foot boardwalk, come check it out. They are starting to come to Vermont to see the projects that we do as craft people that we are exporting and thus importing um, visitors. With that, uh, I'll open up to any questions. <laughs> Conscious of other people's time. Beautiful work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Heartland, I, I first experienced your work in Heartland at Esquibah, which is yes. terrific. Yeah, that was another Nature Conservancy project where we installed a 300 foot accessible boardwalk um, with an accessible parking area. And uh, as I understand it, it's highly used, um, very well loved by the area. 
um, a unique project where the lady slippers and other <laughs> very sensitive species were all flagged prior to our arriving, so they weren't blooming. All you see is the flags, and you're in there saying, please don't step on those. And <laughs> it's very difficult to buy, build a five foot wide boardwalk while monitoring that. But, but we on June 21st, we're all thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is when they're blooming, we welcome you all to come and see them. <laughs> a uh, small footnote I'll add as far as hiring, um, I know it's in, in keeping people in Vermont and uh, encouraging people to stay. Um, I was sharing some thoughts previous to coming here with um, an individual from Nature Conservancy and sharing that we have two employees that work with me, have for the past four years, grew up in Vermont, went to UNH for uh, studies, found out about me, came back to Vermont to work with us, and are now settling down in their late 20s uh, to stay, even though they grew up in Charlotte. Um, and then tomorrow we're interviewing somebody from Colorado that's flying here to work with us uh, to move to Vermont. So there is a dynamic there that is that can't be denied uh, on a small scale, but I hope to see it go bigger. And just the last question, which is um, how many of those uh, projects, how many of your projects would you say VHCB helps fund? I'm going to say, um, so a lot of the VHCB funded projects are typically the larger scale, yeah. have been. Um, so of those 25 to 40, I would say probably five to six um, would be uh, potentials for those. And But the dollar values kind of sway those. A large boardwalk such as the one at Raven Ridge and is a, a big investment for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the ways we end up building more support publicly for uh, keeping open lands open and nature, natural spaces natural is helping more people get out into them. So can yep. you tell you a little more about um, the 88 portion of your work? Is that every project or only some? We're, we're, so of the other five trail builders in Vermont, our specialty is accessibility for certain and technical stonework. We kind of vacillate between the two. The accessible portions are trails that are built to where two wheelchairs can pass. There's a certain grade that is uh, not quite to the level of the state house, which is 5% or less, but we typically keep it 8% because um, you're in a natural setting. Those are national guidelines that we follow set by the feds. And it requires a fair amount of engineering, for sure. And since you work out of state, uh, uh, how's Vermont doing compared to other states? Are there best practices you're seeing elsewhere that we can bring home? I, you know, I, again, I am maybe I'm modest, but um, again, there are only five. I can't keep saying that. There's only five of us that do this, really. We collaborate. We compete. It's kind of the Vermont way. We are also being pulled to Niagara Falls to put in 300 stone stairs down just outside New York City to do a 10-foot wide bike path. People aren't doing this kind of work right. with the same kind of craftsmanship that we offer because we're Vermonters. So we we have we have a serious reputation that is that can't be you know denied. Um, so thanks, Jeff. You're welcome. And and do you have um, is it easy for you to find people to help you with these projects? Like how many jobs do you provide? We could we could be um, a lot larger. It is very difficult to find people who have this type of skill. We're currently working on a boardwalk in uh, Lake Winnipesaukee where we are putting uh, we're on the ice and we're drilling through the ice to put in the foundations to try to stay ahead to be ready for spring for another job. Pretty tough to find people who want to do that. <laughs> right for an apprenticeship opportunity. Yeah. Thank you all yeah. for your work. Thank, Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Lisa Bethesian. I'm from Putney. And I want to thank you all for hearing me today. I'll try to be quick. <laughs> I'm the treasurer of the Putney Historical Society and was first the project manager and then the property manager, now the property manager for the Putney General Store Reconstruction. <laughs> as well as the project manager for the Next Stage Arts Rehabilitation, both Vermont Housing and Conservation Board projects. And most recently, I ran the store business for a few years between proprietor tenants. I'm also a historic preservation consultant and serve on the board of the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And I want to start by thanking you in advance, if it's not <laughs> premature, thanking the legislature for honoring, or hopefully honoring, the late Paul Broon, founder of Preservation Trust of Vermont, as vice chair of the trust and as a friend who learned so much from Paul. Please accept my deep appreciation for your recognition of the profound and positive effect Paul has had on Vermont. Paul and the Preservation Trust collaborated often with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board to support long-term sustainability for Vermont's towns and villages, almost all of which are historic gems, but many of which are struggling economically. As a result, they've had a profound impact on the health of Vermont's communities and not just on its old buildings. I want to tell you how this played out in Putney. 
a town of about 3,000, and I'm sure are familiar to Wyndham County about. represent. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> we're down there, but we're important. <laughs> Um, but we're certainly active. I mean, there's lots happening. Lots in, happening. In Very drama. Story. A lot of drama. <laughs> Partnering with the Preservation Trust and other state and federal agencies, Housing and Conservation Board invested seventy thousand, as well as uh, in feasibility study money in the Putney General Store, helping the nonprofit owner buy it on behalf of the community and restore it as the economic anchor it had been for over two hundred years. Along with the rest of the country, in 2008, our village economy was in crisis. And first our independent bookstore closed, then our 200-year-old general store had a fire and closed as well, and finally a year after that, our congregational church folded. When the cherished general store burned, Paul Bruin was there the next day, offering engineering assistance and advice to a stunned store owner and the community grieving the loss of its center. After the owner decided he could not rebuild the historic building, Paul saw that the likely market alternative for the site was demolition. He encouraged the Putney Historical Society to take the novel approach of nonprofit ownership. And though people in the commercial and economic development community were skeptical, uh, a packed meeting hall enthusiastically endorsed the idea. And with a nonprofit model, the Housing and Conservation Board and donors were able to jump in and help. And in fact, the Housing and Conservation Board was the first state organization to support the project with a grant to buy the burned building. This was an enormous vote of confidence for a local historical society taking on the role of a community development organization. The state support was a huge asset in raising the rest of the funds. With the guidance of the Preservation Trust and the Housing and Conservation Board, we secured loans, purchased, and then stabilized the historic store. <laughs> and while that was going on, the Historical Society was asked to take on the former Congregational Church, another treasured historic gathering place across the street from the store. We, we, but before we could figure out what to do with the 1841 church, a major tragedy struck. The stabilized store building, a project that had involved hundreds of local donors and was near completion, was burned to the ground by an arsonist. Now, arson is always a terrible and violent crime, but in this case, it felt like the entire town was kicked in the gut. And when the second fire happened, I called Paul in the middle of the night as we watched it burn. He came the next day and sat with us and other stakeholders as we tried to pick up the pieces. And even though many of us were too devastated to think of continuing, somehow the meeting ended up inspiring us to start again. And significantly, the Housing and Conservation Board stood by us with their support, even though we technically no longer had a historic building to preserve. This again proved to be a catalyst for other funders to stay with the project, now a reconstruction to restore the downtown heart of Putney. And you can see from the pictures that it really is the heart of our historic district and our village. This tragedy also had an unexpected silver lining. When the whole town wanted to gather after the fire to mourn the store, we of course turned to the Congregational Church, which had long served as a venue to town weddings and funerals. It felt like half the town wanted to speak or perform, and the other half came to celebrate <coughs> its door. When we heard the incredible acoustics of the room and saw an audience of over 200 people sitting happily on 100-year-old pew cushions for over two hours, we thought, perhaps the old church could have a new life as a theater. And again, the Housing and Conservation Board partnered with us and with the Preservation Trust to first assess the building's needs and feasibility of this adaptive reuse, and then gave us key funding of about 140000 when we were ready to move ahead with a major rehabilitation project. The project was intended not only to find a use for the ch church, but to help revitalize the village center and support its other small businesses. So, much to our amazement, we in fact secured a total of $1.3 million for the Putney General Store, which reopened in 2011. The BHCB's piece of that was only 70,000. A few years after that, a $1.5 million campaign turned the old church into next stage, a state-of-the-art performance venue. I hope you've come to <laughs> some of the performances. It partners with schools, arts organizations, and restaurants and brings folks downtown. <clears throat> Housing and Conservation Board support for both projects was a foundation for their success by honoring our local support and leveraging other funding. And as remarkable as this story seems to be, it's not, in fact, unique. All over Vermont, the Housing and Conservation Board advocates for village centers by working with communities to save their small commercial and local acres. In Putney, the drama of two fires certainly helped gain publicity and in turn helped with fundraising. But most towns don't have such an extreme story to tell. 
the Housing and Conservation Board is a key partner to all communities and truly sees them when um, even their troubles are not on the front page. The board is so effective because in partnering with local communities and other organizations like the Preservation Trust that bring other resources to bear, they're leveraging state dollars into major investments involving private, private and public funding. <coughs> It's also very vital because it's one of the few sources available to small village projects like this, as opposed to larger towns or more focus on urban uh, problems. So back in Putney, our skeptics stand in awe as the nonprofit community-driven model has proven to work in our village. I note that despite nonprofit ownership, we pay full property taxes on the store property because it's a uh, for-profit business. And the story of Putney makes the case that even when the real estate market doesn't value something, a community can take control of its own destiny and redefine value through their own investment. These housing and conservation board projects fill a very real gap between low real estate market values and the actual cost of rehab and construction, between commercial models that depend on business volume and the reality of Vermont's low density rural population. So since the Putney General Store reopened in 2011, the Historical Society has worked closely with its proprietors and even ran it ourselves for three years to make sure the business remains healthy and viable. And we recently sold the business to a couple with store experience, vision and drive, who are dedicated to making this a great success. So as one of the two managers who recently ran the business, I learned just how much it really means to our town by watching people connect with their neighbors every day by seeing the store and its network of customers act as an informal social service for those who have nowhere else to turn. Mm -hmm. By providing 12 to 14 mostly local people jobs, and many of them, you know, young people having their job for the first time. That's not easy, let me tell you. <laughs> Most importantly, I see that if the Historical Society did not own and protect this anchor, the business could easily disappear, as many in Putney and other small villages have. <clears throat> So the Housing and Conservation Board is one of the few organizations providing this critical support to small communities trying to conserve what they have. And it takes community investment and effort in the face of an increasingly challenging economic environment to preserve those things, those places and programs and businesses that are the core of village and community life, those things that make Vermont such a great place to live and work. So thank you, and I urge you to fully fund the VHCB. Uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you are there uh, any committee questions? Right. So we are um, at time, actually. It was perfect timing. I just want to thank everyone for coming in um, and reminding us of a uh, uh, sad loss of Paul Bloom this past year. I'm looking out. I see generations of people who have worked on these projects. And you know, I, it's uh, one of the things I most appreciate is what we've heard about just this small sample today from housing, ski areas, walkways, swimming holes, general stores, salvage yards, cleaned up, river quarters reestablished, churches, performance centers, and I know that that's just a small sam sampling of the many creative projects you do that uh, are really palpable investments in real Vermont values, what makes the place special, uh, what we all value, and I appreciate that you are the uh, leading on keeping those Vermont places special and intact for those of us. And in large measure, the volunteer energy that is making it happen yes because so. there are a few professionals out there we see but m many of you are you know v volunteer time which is an incredible gift to the state thank you so we only had an, an hour with all of you at once together right now but uh, we're all happy to be uh, catch us any time today or other times hold our feet to the fire help, help us get this work done thank you